So, so I, I'm going to be talking to you about um, the importance of um, doing something about smoking and treating tobacco dependency. And I'm very mindful, because I, I walked in, having travelled up from London today, when Gordon was doing his fantastic talk and talking about the things that are beneficial to people at the end of life, one of which includes smoking, um, which I completely get. So it made me think of a woman who... Um, I, I first came across her when she had severe, very severe COPD, and we probably spent about five years talking about, you know, tobacco and was she ready yet or blah blah blah. And she never was, and uh, we used to sort of joke about it. But I never stopped going on about it. But we were good friends nonetheless. The last, the last couple of months of her life, she was in a nursing home, and I would go around every couple of weeks um, just to check on things. And one of the sort of great pleasures for her and to be honest for me was actually wheeling her outside to have a chat and a cigarette I wasn't smoking by the way but um, so I, 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 we need to put this into context which is that we, we've the last two talks have been about people to closer towards the end of life and very much what I'm talking about here is catching people much earlier on in their life um, but not stopping at the end if people choose to want to quit smoking so just kind of put a bit of perspective there so, as Hilary said, um, I'm chair of the Primary Care Respiratory Society UK. It is a UK society, and we're really interested in people from Scotland, but you don't join us that much, so we are going to try and be more relevant to you. Um, and the other things that I've been involved in, the primary care lead for the National COPD Audit, which is run by the Royal College of Physicians, for, but for primary care, it has only been running in Wales. Um, but I think, actually... Um, the next round of audit hopefully is going to include Scotland as well, so um, hopefully we'll be, be able to tell you something about that in the future. Um, my conflicts of interest are that I'm employed by PCRS UK and most of our funding comes from uh, companies that, that make drugs and equipment for respiratory or, or tobacco related problems, um, not tobacco companies obviously, and, and I do do talks for medical agencies as well. So. Um, so I thought what I would do um, uh, would be to, because I didn't know about this when I decided to write the talk, is go back and have a look and see where things are in terms of your tobacco control strategy for Scotland. So tobacco control is quite a broad term and involves some of the stuff that you should be involved in, um, but involves some of the stuff that other people are involved in too. So the big wins that we've had around um, reducing the prevalence of tobacco use in Scotland and in the UK is around legislation and is around public health interventions. Um, within legislation, we've got things like um, you know, uh, illegal tobacco, um, trying to avoid that coming in, um, trying to prevent underage sales. These are the sort of things that, that are part of tobacco control, but obviously not something that as healthcare professionals you're going to be deliberately um, or particularly related to. So um, I said public health measures legislation. So the smoking ban, which I'm sure all of you will be aware of, has led, um, and it's been very well noticed in Scotland, is a reduction in heart attack emissions, reduced uh, childhood asthma emissions to hospital, and fewer premature deaths. Um, tobacco use is associated with over 13,000 deaths, which is a quarter of all the deaths in Scotland every year, and 56,000 hospital emissions in Scotland. So this strategy, which came in in 2013 and is a five-year strategy, so it finishes next year, um, was really there to, to build on the work that had already been done as a result of legislation and public health interventions and to deal with the huge burden of tobacco. And what your government agreed to do was to, to maintain the current levels of um, services for, for dealing with tobacco over the next five years. And has that happened? I don't know. Does it feel like it or does it feel like it's changed? Well, I think you're probably OK here in Scotland, but in England you may well have heard that we've had massive swinging cuts of local authority budgets. And in 2012, all of our money for treating tobacco dependency went into local authorities, which means the health environment was thinking, oh, they're doing it. But actually, anything that's health related now within local authorities has been cut. So they'll still do the underage smoking, uh, tobacco sales. They'll still do the legislation, um, um, legal tobacco, that sort of thing. But they're not going to be funding to the same extent the stop smoking services, and in some cases none at all. So at least in Scotland, you've managed to to see that going ahead. And have your services remained the same? 
No. Have you seen change? What's happened? Sorry? The money seems... To, is that everywhere? Not everywhere. So someone back there. Increasing. And whereabouts are you? In the prison service, where it really should be. Yeah, okay, brilliant. Um, so I think maybe, so maybe there is some variation as well here in Scotland, which, which I didn't, didn't think I was aware of. I, I, I kind of imagined you still had a uniform service as well. Um, so the, the ambition um, with your five-year plan that finishes next year is to reduce smoking prevalence by 2036 to 4%. Um, and in 2016, it should be uh, 17%. So, um, so that's that, that's what the expected um, target is going to be. Um, but not sure that we've necessarily made that. And I'm going to show some some uh, slides later on that give you a more up-to-date uh, reading. Um, I mean, it's all very much better now than it was like when I was born. So I think 50% of, of adults smoked in 1968 when I was born. Um, so what is relevant in terms of tobacco control for us as healthcare professionals? So um, tobacco control is about prevention. So creating an environment where young people do not want to smoke. So um, in a number of boroughs in London, and I noticed it the other night in Tower Hamlets, uh, which is in the East End, I was walking past a school and there were signs all over the school's um, front gates saying do not smoke here. So um, the local authority in that borough has made particular attempts to ensure that at the school gates people are not smoking. So that's a, a, almost a legislative or a public health intervention. Then there's protection, protecting people from secondhand smoke. So in Scotland, as well as in England, you have legislation around smoking in cars. And then the last bit, which is the bit that we really can do something about, is helping people to quit smoking. Um, so there is a almost 50 action um, uh, report from, tw from 2013. Now, again, as I say, it ends next year. And some of the things that they were saying that I picked up on um, so, and again, these are not things that you can do individually, but you might be aware or not aware of it, is that all NHS boards will implement and enforce <coughs> smoke-free grounds by March 2015. Has that happened? It, it's kind of happening, okay. Um, smoke-free status means the removal of any designated smoking areas in NHS board buildings or grounds. Is there still smoking hoods? So you've got smoking hoods for e-cigarettes, smoking hoods for tobacco, or has that gone? You're still doing it. So it's still happening. Okay, so, so there's been some movement towards that. Um, we will work with boards to raise awareness of the move to smoke-free hospital grounds. This action will not apply to mental health facilities. So what do you think about that? Why do you think they decided that? Sorry? And, and, and actually, in England, it's, it's the mental health hospitals who've absolutely taken a lead on smoke-free sites. So I would be surprised, actually, if you know, the, the, you know, the boards, the directors, the medical directors, the chief nurses of mental health trust don't really want the same thing, because, of course, it's a much bigger problem. You know, what's the prevalence of tobacco use on an inpatient unit in, in a hospital, potentially? What's, what sort of prevalence is it? So the UK prevalence of smoking is 15.5% at the moment. What do you think it is on a, a serious mental illness unit? Yeah, it's about 75%, up as, far as, far as high as 80% potentially. Um, so it's very interesting that in 2013, that was part of the five-year tobacco strategy for Scotland. And I think what, what is happening now is that we've, we're moving on so rapidly. I think health is increasing taking the responsibility for dealing with tobacco and I think we've actually moved on a huge amount in the last four years and there's some really interesting evidence coming out of mental health trusts about how care has improved as a result of um, having a managed nicotine replacement and tobacco support <coughs> service within the hospital. 
So some other um, actions within the plan. So key aims of the collaborative will be to refer 90% of women who have raised CO levels or who are smokers to smoking cessation services. This is pregnant women, sorry I should have put that in there. NHS boards should develop systems and provide training to ensure clear and effective care pathways for smoking in pregnancy in line with current guidance. This should include CO monitoring at booking and automatic referral to stop smoking services. So there are GPs in the room. So my question is when you do a booking visit, as well as checking blood pressure and urine and past medical history, do you do an exhaled CO level? Does anybody do that? Midwives do it. And you, your midwife will do it at booking, but you won't do it at booking as a GP. You don't book women. So they go straight to midwife. They never come to the GP. Okay, so you won't be doing that anyway. Are the midwives doing it? And has that become routine now? A little bit and a little not. Yeah, so it's a... It's a some really interesting work from the northeast of England, the Baby Clear Project. Have you heard of that one? So um, they've been on a, a journey for quite a few years around this. And whereas now CO monitoring at booking is completely expected and normal and midwives are very happy with it. And they've moved on to do some research looking at uh, the, the benefits to um, birth weight in women who have managed to quit smoking as a result of that program. But what, what they found at the beginning that is there was a huge amount of resistance to doing exhale CO monitoring. People didn't quite know how to, to start, how to get into the conversation. Will it feel like a lie test? What's it going to be like? But actually lots of insight work with women who were likely to be smoking in, preg in pregnancy, so usually teenage women, was that just be consistent with us. We want everybody to say the same thing, whether you're my social worker, whether you know, you're know you the local community leader, whether you're the GP, the practice nurse, the midwife. I want you all to be truthful to me about what the impact of smoking is on my baby and let me make a decision about it. Um, so they're absolutely fine with it and the evidence is showing that, um, but it's a bit tricky when you start to do it. So, uh, action 43, um, within the context of health and social care integration, NHS boards should take action to ensure health professionals address smoking in all care settings and provide effective and person-centred referral pathways to appropriate smoking cessation support. Does that, has that happened, do you think? Maybe yes, maybe no. How, how many, so I'm assuming that almost all of you in here are healthcare professionals. How many of you have been trained to have the right conversation with a smoker, i.e., have you done very brief advice training? So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so the vast majority of people in the room have not been trained to have the right conversation with people who are currently smoking. So uh, we might go back to that in a little bit, but that is one of the real elements of this tobacco control plan was that everybody, no matter who you come into contact, is going to be having the same conversation, trained to do it in exactly the same way in order that an evidence-based outcome is achieved. And this is not about you not being aware of how to engage with patients or how to use the right language, but the intervention, BBA, is a public health population-focused intervention of Ask, Advise, Act. And it's a public health intervention, which means it's a bit like walking past a poster with, you know, a cigarette and a, you know, atheromatous artery or something. It's meant to be something that happens exactly the same time, is delivered by healthcare professionals, but is not actually a treatment. It's a public health intervention, no different from walking past a public health information sign. And so if we haven't done the training, the very brief advice we're doing may not be working, and it only really works if we all do it exactly the same way. So that's a concept that I think is sometimes missed around VBA, but why it is so important to do the 20-minute training to do this 30-second intervention, because that's the evidence behind it. So... Um, so what has the impact been of the, uh, the stop smoking ban, sorry, the stop smoking legislation and uh, strategy for Scotland that started in 2013? Well, looking at 2016, so two years before, before the end, one in five adults were current cigarette smokers. 
so that's 21%, which is similar to 2014. There was a significant decrease in children's reported exposure, which is very positive, from 11% to 6%. So there's definitely something working there. 35% of adults in the most deprived socioeconomic group um, compared to 11% in the least deprived. So that, you know, as we know, there is still a big margin between the least, off, least, least best off and the, wor and the worst off in, in, in our, our country. Um, and 28% of adults, so the people that we see coming in regularly into our surgeries, have a, um, who have a limiting long-term health condition um, compared to the background population was 18. So, I mean, guess what this means is that we as health professionals are now seeing those patients who, have, who do continue to smoke as that number continues to come down. So there is something about us being, being trained and feeling confident to do this work. So you've actually, I mean, again, as a result of having to do this talk, I went and had a look at what you've got available here in Scotland, and you've got some really good material, actually, um, which is very much focused on what to do in general practice, what to do um, across the desk with your patient. Um, so you've got a very good guide to smoking cessation, um, which was written in 2010 and was updated in 2017, and it's very practical and very helpful. Um, this um, excerpt here um, tells you what your processes are, what you've got available in Scotland. So you do the brief intervention, intervention provided by a healthcare practitioner or indeed a social care or community worker. So it's not just health professionals who need to do VBA. We could also get social care also working with us on that as well. And then you have your various options depending on what the patient wants to do when you do the advice and then you decide what your act is going to be. And then there are for um, the option to do referral from brief interventions into something that's more effective. So multi-session intensive groups and there are certain um, members, uh, members of our population who are going to need a lot more because they're higher risk of relapse. One of those is people with COPD. Um, they're very, if you're, you know, if you've got COPD, it's very likely that you're going to be high risk of lapse and it's going to be harder to quit, so they do need intensive services. Um, but they can quit. Um, and then, um, and the, this just the, the reminder of, you know, the example they give for pregnant women and other groups as well, and this is the one about also doing the CO breath test. So um, why should we make this a priority? Well... A, because we all know it's the right thing to do. So, um, you know, probably half of you in this room, at least, will have been personally affected because a friend or a relative will have had uh, impact on their health or their life as a result of tobacco. So you all know that already, OK? Um, but actually, the treatment of tobacco dependency is incredibly effective if only we do it properly. So I, I would say that... You know, the first thing is the fact that this room is typical of most rooms I go to, which is that, um, you know, your, your conscientious, good health professionals who I'm sure use the right language with patients, but only a handful are being trained to deliver the very brief advice. So that's kind of step one. So if only we could make that happen for everybody, that would be great. But actually then when we start to give the treatment, um, so comparison of effectiveness of a brief intervention versus other treatment. So if we have a look at statins, which, you know, we all regularly provide to patients and we'll be very positive about, you know, number needed to treat 107. We work really hard to get people's blood pressure down. You need to treat 700 to have an impact on stroke, MI or death over one year. So GP brief advice to stop smoking prevents one premature death and you only need to treat 80 for that. So we know that even that intervention, if it's done right, can be incredibly effective. If we add in tobacco pharmacotherapy, the number needed to treat to get the outcome, which is a, a avoidance of a premature death, it's 38 to 56. Okay? If we just do behavioural support, it's 16 to 40. So the key thing is, is that the more that we do with people who are tobacco dependent and are ready to quit, um, 
the better value it is. And this is um, described in, in the COPD value pyramid, which maybe some of you have seen before, which looks at the relative value of interventions which are currently evidence-based and for COPD. We know that flu vaccine is very highly valuable in, in terms of it provides the outcomes that patients want and it's cost-effective. So stop smoking support with pharmacotherapy, £2,000 per quality, which sits way below the 20,000 quality, which certainly nice sets, and I'm not quite sure what the, the level is set in Scotland, but I imagine it's probably something similar. Um, right at the top, telehealth is about 90,000, two-thirds of, two of those patients with COPD, and triple therapy, which can be up to 180,000 pounds per quality. So we know that this is a really effective intervention, but we don't seem to do it so much. And so the question is, is why, why you know, we know the impact, we know the cost on society, we know the cost on us personally from what's happened to our friends and relatives. Um, I'm telling you about the number needed to treat, I'm telling you it's effective, I'm gonna tell you it's safe, but we still don't seem to do it. So that's quite an interesting concept in itself. And so part, part of the work that we've been certainly doing in PCRS is, is trying to change the thinking around this. So rather than the use of tobacco being entirely a lifestyle choice, so it is at the beginning, but probably within a couple of weeks you're addicted. It's very quick. And, you know, at the end, like Gordon was describing earlier, you know, it clearly is, uh, clearly is a choice there that people have decided to do it. But actually for a lot of people, um, what it is is really a long-term and relapsing condition, and it usually starts in childhood. So what's the average age for commencing tobacco use? 14. Yeah, yeah. So that's really quite young, isn't it? So it is a condition that starts in childhood. Um, and it, to be honest, and you will probably all agree with this, is it's usually in families as well, isn't it? So it's familial. And the idea of a COPD patient who is an ex-smoker, I kind of think that this is somebody who is in remission from tobacco dependency as, as opposed to an ex-smoker, because I know that restarting and having failed attempts and having another go is absolutely something that the, is part of these people's lives for those who really would like to do something about it. So it's not just PCRS UK, so the gold guideline for COPD has massively strengthened its approach towards <coughs> tobacco dependency and the wording in the latest iteration. Previously there was a very, very small amount about smoking but now it describes it as a tobacco dependence, as a chronic disease, that relapse is common, and it is not a failure <coughs> on the part of the patient or the clinician if relapse happens. So if my patient, who I've given amlodipine 5 to, comes back and their blood pressure is not under control, I don't feel like a failure, I increase the amlodipine, or I might decide to go to ramipril or something like that. So if we consider, see, tobacco dependence to be a long-term condition, we shouldn't see them currently smoking as a failure, but an opportunity to think, what else do we want to do now? There was a, an article in the New England Journal of Medicine which actually talked about smoking being the disorder and not COPD. And actually, we should think about COPD being a comorbidity with tobacco dependency. And the WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Control record tobacco dependence as a disease or disorder and include its treatment in services covered. So I just think that if we start to um, think about tobacco use differently, and certainly as health professionals, so maybe, you know, not out in the street on a Friday night, you know, when people are having a cigarette, but actually people who come into our room, if they're coming into our room and they've got tobacco attributable conditions or their next step in their health pathway might make them worse because of smoking. So if they need a, you know, an operation and there might be a wound healing issue, then actually we need to treat it as a tobacco dependence that needs treating. So we also probably ought to think about tobacco dependence in the long term, but also in the short term as well. So I mentioned the North East England Baby Clear project, and what they have shown, having worked at this over, over a number of years, is where they were able to intervene with women, their babies were, were 260 grams heavier, which it's important to get the language right here, because actually how many times have you thought, oh, well, I'm happy if the baby's smaller because it'll come out easier. But actually, 
If it's lighter because of tobacco, that's, that means there's been placental insufficiency. And baby has essentially been relatively starved. And at 260 grams, I don't know if that sounds like a lot to you, but it does to me. Prior to being a GP, I was, I was a registrar in Obst and Gynae, and, you know, I, I would have women on bed rest, premature, threatened premature labour with small babies, and every 10 days they'd have their scan and they'd be hoping to get to 1.5 grams, 1.7 grams. Can I get to two kilos? Um, you know, because their baby would then have a greater chance of survival. So actually a quarter of a kilo is really quite important. Um, so I guess this is showing that actually the stuff we do can have a real impact in the short term. And in relation to respiratory, we know that it reduces respiratory infections. Why wouldn't we want to help our patients to quit smoking? Because our lists in the winter will be much quieter. We won't be seeing quite so many people coming through with acute bronchitis. And Jimmy Patton said at this meeting a few years ago that nothing in his career, Jimmy Patton, paediatrician from Glasgow, nothing in his career that he had ever done had impacted on asthma admissions as much as the stop smoking ban in 2007. This graph here shows you that where the line is um, two thirds of the way across the vertical line was when the smoking ban in public places came in and literally asthma admissions fell off a cliff afterwards. So it does have a real impact and we need to be thinking about how we approach families where asthma is a condition. I'm probably running out of time. Um, two or three minutes. Two or three minutes. So I'm just going to finish off by talking about something that's come out in the literature over the last year. Uh, and I was lucky enough to do a webinar with the author of this paper, uh, which hopefully we can share with you online if you want to have a look at it, um, looking at something called the Ottawa model. So what they do is that for patients who are admitted to hospital, they have a, a structured, um, systematic process in their hospitals where they identify tobacco dependence, they document it, they give evidence-based advice because people are trained to do VBA. Where people want to take action, they initiate pharmacotherapy and behavioural support. And then importantly, when patients go home, they have proper, absolutely assured, continued support if the patients want it. And this is just a, a description of the study that they did, which involved 14 hospitals and a two-year follow-up. Their primary outcome measure was all-cause readmissions and all-cause mortality, and you can see there's a number of secondary outcomes there as well that they looked at. In the control group that did not get the structured approach, there was a 20% smoking abstinence. It was 35% in the Ottawa model. They showed a 46% decrease in all-cause readmissions, a 40% um, decrease in smoking related readmissions and their all cause ER visits were also reduced by 22%. They weren't doing anything that we can't do today. They have the same pharmacotherapy, they have the same training system, like uh, in, in England, the National Centre of Smoking Cessation Training, which you can access if you just say you're from England when you go online. Um, and uh, so they have all the same things, but what they have done is they've put a systematised structure in. And the, the hospitals that have been involved have changed their approach. And there's been a lot of getting very senior buy-in, the chief executive, the medical director, to make this very much part of the approach. Because 28% of our beds today are occupied by people who have been admitted because of smoking-related diseases. If we want to have an impact on um, admissions, it does make sense that we may need to be doing something more about tobacco. It also, because they looked at it over a two-year span, um, they also saw reductions in death, um, all-cause death, at the end of the year, 48% um, there. So very significant outcomes. So we know that that works if we do it the right way. Um, this is really just a slide just to point you towards some work that I did with colleagues in London. We, had a, we did an 18-month programme for the Clinical Senate in London, which is around providing pragmatic advice to other healthcare professionals about how to help smokers quit. It was a challenge from the Mayor's Office, the public health lead in the Mayor's Office in London, who said, 
we've done all of this, public health stuff, the smoking ban, the legislation, what are you doing in health? So our response was CO4. One is that we have to be able to have the right conversation with patient, so not just a chat, let's do the right intervention and be trained to do it. We think we should be using CO monitoring as a tool um, to motivate patients. Also, for example, in hospital to identify people who are going to be at risk of nicotine withdrawal and then to do the humane thing, which is to provide them with something that they want to use. We ought to include, we ought to be recording it better, which includes actually putting it on death certificates. And there's been some really interesting work in Southampton where they've been doing this. And, and then the responsibility of any of us in the system that are commissioners to ensure that those systems are in place, like in Ottawa, which helps us to get those results. My final slide is because someone will ask about this. <laughs> um, so uh, e-cigarettes is now being used for harm reduction in hospital and community settings. In the October campaign in England, it was supported to use e-cigarettes as part of a harm reduction or a, a, a bit, something to help you to quit in October. Um, this is Linda Bold, who um, is a professor of health policy from the University of Stirling, so works around um, cancer and in tobacco and alcohol as well. This is a video, which you've got the link there, and I know that you've got the slides, which is 13 minutes long and it talks about the current evidence and what we know about e-cigarettes and where it fits in for us as health professionals in terms of working with patients. So I would urge you to have a look at that because I haven't got the extra 13 minutes now here to show it to you, but I do recommend it. The, the other thing, and we mentioned earlier that in 2013, your government didn't, put, didn't suggest mental health units become smoke-free. Clearly, the clinicians in the mental health units have decided that doesn't make sense because they're the ones that are smoking most. And what they've done is they've started to put things in place. And South London and Maudsley Trust, which is in my part of London, um, one of the biggest concerns about um, putting in a stop smoking environment across the whole grounds and not doing escorted leave for people with SMI who were obviously, obviously nicotine dependent is that there would be increase in aggression, increase in challenging behaviour. The Lancet Psychiatry published this year um, a study done at SLAM which showed as a result of a, a systematised nicotine withdrawal system um, utilising e-cigarettes where people would smoke in their rooms. So they didn't take them outside to continue the traditional thing if you go outside and have your break and have your knee cigarette. So they were allowed to smoke in their rooms so they didn't affect other people on the ward. And what they found that there was a decrease in aggression and challenging behavior rather than an increase. So we have all been very challenged by this surge in the use of e-cigarettes, what that means is it right for us to health profession as health professionals support it? Um, it's it's a very tricky area. So, you know, for us, the tobacco companies have always been the devil. Clearly, you know, we're health professionals interested in respiratory. But what if they, as a result of designing and promoting the e-cigarette, they may actually be having a greater impact on ill health due to tobacco than currently we are through treating tobacco dependency. So I feel that's a bit of a challenge, which is actually if we don't want people using e-cigarettes, well, what are we doing at the moment? Are we providing our patients with evidence-based, very brief advice? Are we prescribing the medication? Are we ensuring that we've got systematic structures in place to ensure that we use what we've got, the evidence that we've got, the guidance that we've got to treat tobacco dependency?